Now we have already given Kenyans a glimpse of the very hard financial times we are headed for on this channel. We did that quite some time back and recently we have done an update. But still, a vast majority of Kenyans have no idea what to expect next. Yeah, because many of them believe the increase in fuel prices, yeah, which has had an effect right across the board, is the worst that we can ever go through. Sadly, mambo bado. Tena bado san. Translation, you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, and in a minute I'm going to explain why. Okay, now meanwhile, the Sharon Otieno investigation <laughs> is getting very, very interesting. Apart from Mr. Michael Oyamu, one of the chief suspects, yeah, who's already at Homa Bay Police Station, apart from him getting a mystery visitor, yeah, who spent about 20 minutes with him inside the cells, there are plenty of other <laughs> very shocking developments in the investigation of this very brutal murder. I shall also look into that in great detail. I've done a lot of research. But first, let us start with the economy. Now, I appreciate the fact that we are not all economists, yeah? And because of that, I'm going to keep this very, very simple. Standard two. <laughs> yeah, I've laughed, but I'm serious. We'll keep it very simple so that we all understand where we are right now and where we're headed, what we should expect. My sincere apologies to all economists and all people who like their news and analysis very complex, very complicated, using economic terms, etc., etc. My sincere apologies. Siki la mtu amesoma, na wengine, baba yao na mama yao kukwa na ngombe ya kutosha ya kuuza waende university. Okay? <laughs> Translation, not everybody had rich parents with plenty of cows to sell so that they would further the education. Now I'm going to tell you exactly where we are economically. Yeah, and I'm going to tell in a simple way with a simple story that we all understand. Where Kenya is right now is like somebody who has just received their salary at the end of the month. Now, very quickly, we all know how Kenyans behave when they have received their salaries. A very famous Kenyan musician, one of my all-time favorites, a man called Daudi Kabaka, illustrated this in a song decades ago in the 60s. And in the song, <laughs> it's very funny because he says, when the money is finished, when your end of uh, month salary is done, yeah, uh, what happens is that you change from English to Kiswahili. Because, Kabaka says in his song, when Nairobians receive their salary, they're not talking Kiswahili. It's just English, yeah, at least in those days. There was no sharing then. Anyway, the long and short of it is that that chicken that you have been salivating over every day yeah, during the month when you didn't have any money in your pocket, yeah, <laughs> you rush into a fish and chips, immediately receive your salary, and you gorge yourself with a full chicken. And where you're drinking water mostly, you rush into a supermarket and buy yourself a cold Coke, etc., etc. Yeah, people on the outside can see that things are okay. You have no problem. Now, in the days when Kabaka sang this song, yeah, there used to be something called Advance. I don't know if it's still there today. And this was normally paid around the middle of the month. You got like a small advance yeah, against your salary. And this one was normally very carefully budgeted yeah, to last you until the end of the month when you'd receive your next salary. Now, this is precisely where Kenya is as a country. Kenya has just received her salary. However, there's going to be no advance. And at the end of the month, there'll be no salary. So you would think that Kenya would be very careful with the little money they have. Take a pass on that chicken, yeah, soda out. They would carefully budget this money to last them until the day they will get a new job. Or at least as close as possible to that day. Because actually that day is unknown. When you lose a job, getting another job in Kenya, ay, yeah, 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 yeah. In other words, what I'm saying is that this is the time for the government to put in yeah, those very tough cost-cutting measures yeah, and those measures to conserve the little money we have, the little cash resources we have, until things get better. 
just like a person who's lost their job would do. However, what is the government doing? The government is not even admitting that there's a problem. The government of Kenya is behaving as if everything is okay. And that is where the big issue is, according to me. Yeah, Because just like an individual, it means that the days which are coming, because there's no advance coming, there's no salary at the end of the month coming, there'll be very, very tough times. What will the children go to school with? Yeah, if they take uh, a matatu or some form of transport to school, how will they get to school? Let alone whatever fees need to be paid in school. But even before we get there, what will they eat? I think you get the picture. It's a total disaster. Now, there's another YouTuber that I normally occasionally listen to. Yeah, A man called Professor Haman Manyora. Now, Manyora, in one of his latest videos, puts it this way. He says, the anger which is in Kenyans right now has never been seen before. Kenyans have been angry before, very upset, yeah. But this is a different kind of upset. And he calls this kind of anger informed anger. What he means is that, for instance, Kenyans have been slapped with a 16% VAT on fuel prices, yeah, which has naturally affected virtually everything else, the price of everything else. Now, most Kenyans are very angry, and they're angry because they know why we're in this problem. And why are we in this problem? Somebody will tell you drought, somebody will tell you there's a global recession, yeah, and so on and so forth. And all those answers are wrong. The reason why we're in this fix, yeah, is because of careless, huge, reckless spending by the government. And to make matters worse, yeah, this was, there's evidence to suggest that this was pushed a lot yeah, by greed and corruption. Because politicians knew that as soon as you get a large infrastructural project, there's a lot of money to eat. There's a lot of money which will be flying around to fiddle with here and there in bribes, etc., etc. So that at the end of the day, you end up with a project which is inferior but actually cost a lot more than a very similar project in a neighboring country, which is in fact superior, which cost less. Now what does that mean? It means that uh, the project in Kenya was much more expensive only because of corruption. This is the informed anger that Professor Manyora is talking about. Let me make it even clearer. Yeah. As a result of this overspending on various projects, and by the way, these projects are all done on loans, yeah, and the loans have to be repaid, the government of Kenya has now reached a position whereby the income coming in is not enough to cover the costs of that same government. And those costs range from the very basic, like paying uh, the soldiers, paying the army, paying the police, paying doctors, etc., etc., to others, like paying for that imported car, that car you have imported into the country. Now, how does the government pay for it? You order for a car, and of course you've done all your calculations in Kenya shillings, but the company in Japan is not going to accept Kenya shillings. Yeah, It will take US dollars. Therefore, you pay the Kenya government for the Kenya government to pay Japan in US dollars, Yeah, and you receive your car. Now, let alone cars, the other very vital imports, yeah, like medicine for hospitals and so on and so forth. Yeah, again, it's the same procedure. And so, the government needs to have enough money to run the country. Yeah, that's really the long and short of it. And the government has money. But when you do your calculations, yeah, and factor in all the loans the country is paying off, yeah, which have to be paid off on a monthly basis, you will quickly realize that this money is not enough to cover the expenses of the government. And a man called David D has been giving us these calculations for a very long time. Since last year, he has been warning us that, hey, you guys are borrowing too much, slow down, you know, you guys are headed for disaster. But of course nobody listened, yeah, and so here we are. Whatever you're seeing right now, yeah, is just a tip of the iceberg. Because, just to quickly go back to the example I gave of a person, yeah, Kenya has received a salary, it is the first, it is the second, but beware, 15th is coming, and there's going to be no advance. End of month is coming, <laughs> and there's going to be no salary. 
And therefore, don't be fooled by the fact that the day today is first, second, you still have money in your pocket, and fail to see or to imagine what will happen around the 10th, 15th, 22nd, end of the month, and indeed what will happen next month. When you start the month with major, major, major requirements, financial requirements like rent, etc., etc., and you have absolutely no money in your pocket because you don't have a job. And we're already seeing the telltale signs of this, yeah, like the 16% VAT on fuel. The government needs that money desperately. Yeah. Therefore, those who are going around saying that this thing is going to be reversed, huh, they'd better take note of one thing, very important uh, fact here. Even if the 16% tax on petrol is reversed, yeah, and petrol goes back down, our broke government still needs money. And therefore, they will have to find another way of raising that money. They have no choice and no option in this matter. To summarize it, the government will have to cut down costs dramatically and also find ways of raising income. Yeah, Dramatic ways of raising income dramatically. Cost cutting will mean that some certain companies that are relying on government contracts will go bankrupt. They'll have to fire people if they're to survive, by the way, or go bankrupt, which means all people are fired. So a lot of people will be out of jobs. And that company which was relying on the government for contracts also has a lot of other companies relying on them, yeah, to supply them with stationery, etc., etc. So those other companies are also going to be affected. Indirectly, because they don't supply to the government, but they'll be affected in a big way. So I think you have a clearer picture of that. Now, there's more bad news. We have seen other countries like neighboring Zambia, which is now handing over a very vital national asset to the Chinese, yeah, because they've not, been, they've not been able to service their debts, you know, the money they borrowed. We have seen other countries surrender their port. Yes, you can imagine Mombasa port being surrendered to the Chinese. Yeah. Why? Because they couldn't pay their debt. So when you can't pay your debt, you go back to the person you borrowed from, and you sit down and you walk out away, they're going to get paid. And it's going to be always painful for you. As the good book says, the borrower is a slave of the person who has lent them the money. Now let's quickly touch on the politics. This is what Professor Haman Manyora meant when he said informed anger. Yeah? Because when the people are angry and they're informed, they know exactly why we're in this mess, definitely it's going to have political consequences. Let me just leave it at that. Now we're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we'll talk about the investigation into the very brutal murder of Sharon Otieno. You don't want to miss that. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Now on Saturday 8th September, yeah, Bona Michael Oyamo, who is a suspect in the murder of Sharon Otieno, received a visitor. He received this visitor in the police cells. Yeah, the police cells at Homer Bay Police Station. Now many wise Kenyans have been very concerned about the safety of Mr. Oyamo. Yeah. Why are they concerned about the safety of Mr. Oyamo? Mr. Oyamo is a key witness. Yeah, even if he's an accused person, is a very key witness that is indeed helping the police to put together this Sharon Otieno murder mystery. 
Now I've said it before on this channel that I believe it was his information that helped the police find the body in the first place. On Friday, his information led to the arrest of two suspects. There are two suspects whom the police believe were involved in the brutal murder of Sharon Otieno. Indeed, the police have told us that they're pursuing 10 witnesses, or rather 10 suspects, okay, connected to this case. These 10 people were involved in one way or another in this uh, crime. How were they able to identify these 10 suspects? Again, Mr. Michael Oyamu. Now, we shall not go into the details of how the police managed to get information out of uh, people who are suspects. Yeah? <laughs> that is a story for another day. And indeed, it is a story that many Kenyans do not want to hear now because all that Kenyans want is for the murderers, yeah, the people responsible for this very heinous crime, to be brought to book. Kenyans don't care how it's done. Anyway, the long and short of it is that Bonoyamo is very, very important in this investigation. In my view, it is very possible. Yeah, I'm not saying it's going to happen exactly like that. But there's a high possibility that Mr. Oyamo could make a plea bargain. Give the police all the information they want, yeah, because he seems to know a lot, yeah, in exchange uh, for a lighter charge, a lighter sentence. Now, at the time Mr. Oyamo received this strange, mysterious visitor at Homabe police station, Kenyans were still grappling with something very shocking that had happened to a suspect here yeah, in circumstances very similar to Mr. Oyamo's. This suspect's name was David Moy. You will remember David Moy was found dead in the cells in Nairobi. And the police told us that he had hanged himself inside the cells. Now that in itself, as I've said on this channel, is just bizarre. Because we know people are not alone in police cells in Kenya. Yeah, there are a lot of other people around. We also know that when people go into police cells, they do not carry anything that can assist them in hanging themselves, you know, like belts or ropes. So it is highly unlikely, very, very unlikely, almost impossible, not impossible, but almost, for somebody to hang themselves in a police cell in Kenya. But we are told David Moy did that. And incidentally, his case is linked to yet another governor, just like Sharon Otieno's case. Yeah? Moy's case was linked to the Garissa governor, yeah? Bwana Ali Korane. And then, at around the same time that Moy allegedly hanged himself in his police cell, his wife vanished into thin air. She has still not been found or seen to this day. Now, that is all very recent drama, indeed last week. Now, in that kind of environment, you hear that Bonoyamo had access to a visitor. Ay, 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 ay. Now, Mr. Oyamo's visitor has been identified as a Mr. Lucas Oko. Lucas Oko said that he works for the KDF, yeah, and he was allowed into the cell and met with Mr. Oyamo for about 20 minutes. Now, a reporter with the Nation newspapers followed up later with this Mr. Oko, and Mr. Oko said that he was there on official, uh, in official capacity, yeah, because uh, he works for KDF. Now, something very interesting happened. After talking to this reporter, Bwana Oko switched off his phone. He could not be reached. What was he hiding? And so the reporters at Nation went to KDF and asked KDF, did you send anybody to see Bwana Michael Oyamu in police custody in Homabe? Guess what KDF said? They said, no, we have not sent any such person. Now, shortly after this story is published, Bwana Lucas Oko resurfaces. He says that in fact he works for KDF. Yeah, he works with military intelligence at a place called Mtongwe in Mombasa. That is in the north coast, immediately after you cross the Likoni Ferry. Now Mtongwe is a huge navy base. It's a navy military base. So Banaoka has told the press that's where he works. And he was sent on official duty to see Bwanaoyamo. Yeah, and indeed Bwanaoyamo used to work with the navy. He's a former military officer. My sincere apologies. Actually, Mutongo is in the south coast, not north coast. South coast, Mombasa. 
Anyway, what Wanooko says is that he's following up on Mr. Yamo to find out whether he cleared properly with the Navy before he left. You know, if you leave the military without permission, it's a criminal offense. Yeah, it's called deserting. Yeah. So this is what Bonooko claims he was following up with Bonoyamo when Bonoyamo was in police custody. Now, 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 that is quite a story. And it is quite a story because of the timing. Because if this story was true, I doubt whether it's true. And anybody who works for the military will tell you it is not true. Yeah, but anyway, if this story was true, the other channels and the other methods that uh, Bonooko would have used to get this information from Bonoyamo, yeah, it would have gone through official channels. They would even have gone to court and said the person you're holding, yeah, has other charges that they may face, yeah, for deserting the army, yeah, and they'd have uh, given the court that notice. The other more compelling reason is why the urgency, yeah, what is so urgent with finding out if Bonoyamo left the military properly in 2004. That was what? 13 years ago. So what is the agency all about right now when he has been arrested? And more importantly, when he's assisting police in solving this murder mystery? One cannot help but speculate that this person was sent to get to Mr. Oyamu to pass messages to him. Messages to ensure that Bwanawayamu protects some very important people who are linked and connected to this crime. Otherwise, why else? Would Bwana Luka Sooko need to speak to Bwana Oyamo while he's in police custody? Why else? And in any case, if it's true that they suspected Bwana Oyamo deserted the military, yeah, then uh, the records with the KDF, the Kenya Defense Forces, are much more important than what Bwana Oyamo has to say. Indeed, what Bwana Oyamo has to say is irrelevant. Yeah, what is relevant are the records. Yeah, what was signed, what is the procedure, all those records are with the Kenya Defense Forces, nothing to do with Mr. Oyamo. And therefore, if there are any charges, what would ordinarily happen is that uh, they would charge Bwana Oyamo yeah, for deserting the military. And then Bwana Oyamo would give whatever information he has in his defense in a court of law, in a court martial, defending himself. In other words, there was absolutely no need and no excuse to see Bwana Oyamo concerning his time at the military or anything to do with the stint at the military, especially at this time. There was no need, there's no logical explanation that makes sense that would support uh, this allegation. Now, the latest is that the Dep uh, Director of Public Prosecution, Bwana Nuruddin Haji, seems to agree because he has ordered a probe into the incident to investigate under what circumstances this person was allowed access to see Bwana Oyamu. Wow, this is getting super interesting, isn't it? Now, before I go, I'd just like to say a quick thing. Kenyans will need to prepare themselves for a change of leadership in Migori. And it doesn't matter whether Bwana Okotho Bado is guilty or not. It doesn't matter whether Bwana Okotho Bado is arrested or not. Politically, is finished. There are many reasons why, but I'll tell you the main reason. The governor ruled Migori with an iron hand. And this kind of leadership creates very many enemies. And some of these enemies are lawyers who are more than capable of convincing a court of law that Bonokotho Bado is no longer fit to hold office. And that is assuming that somebody outside Migori does not get to that case faster yeah, than uh, Bonobado's enemies. So all these things of having people issue statements to the public that, oh, it is Mr. Obado's enemies after him, or Mr. Obado has many enemies, they won't work. Even this thing of organizing for people to buy all the newspapers in Migori County so that the people cannot see yeah, on the front page of the newspapers the story about their governor, all that is futile. Maziwe kimwagika aizoleki. Yeah, spilt milk cannot be retrieved from the road where it has spilt. It's gone. It's done. So this would be a very good time to start paying very close attention to the deputy governor of Migori. 
I mean, the man has been so low profile, nobody even knows him. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekucha. <laughs>